John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, also known as John Brown's raid or the raid on Harper's Ferry, was an effort by abolitionist John Brown to initiate an armed slave revolt in 1859 by taking over a United States arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Brown's party of 22 was defeated by a company of U.S. Marines, led by First Lieutenant Israel Green. Colonel Robert E. Lee was in overall command of the operation to retake the arsenal. John Brown had originally asked Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, both of whom he had met in his transformative years as an abolitionist in Springfield, Massachusetts, to join him in his raid, but Tubman was prevented by illness and Douglass declined, as he believed Brown's plan would fail. <laughs> Brown's preparation John Brown rented the Kennedy farmhouse, with a small cabin nearby, 4 miles .4 kilometers north of Harper's Ferry near the community of Dargan in Washington County, Maryland, and took up residence under the name Isaac Smith. Brown came with a small group of men minimally trained for military action. His group included 18 men besides himself 13 white men, 5 black men. Northern abolitionist groups sent 198 breech-loading .52 caliber Sharps carbines. Beecher's Bibles, and 950 pikes obtained in late September from Charles Blair of Collinsville Axe Company in Collinsville, Connecticut, in preparation for the raid. The United States Armory was a huge complex of buildings that manufactured small arms for the U.S. Army 1801 with an arsenal storehouse that was thought to contain 100,000 muskets and rifles at the time. Brown attempted to attract more black recruits. He tried recruiting Frederick Douglass as a liaison officer to the slaves in a meeting held in a quarry at Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. It was at this meeting that ex-slave, Emperor, Shields Green consented to join with John Brown on his attack on the United States Armory, Green stating to Douglass, I believe I will go with the old man. Douglass declined, indicating to Brown that he believed the raid was a suicide mission. The plan was, an attack on the federal government. That would array the whole country against us. You will never get out alive. He warned, the Kennedy farmhouse served as barracks, arsenal, supply depot, mess hall, debate club, and home. It was very crowded and life there was tedious. Brown was worried about arousing neighbors' suspicions. As a result, the raiders had to stay indoors during the daytime, without much to do but study, drill, argue politics, discuss religion, and play cards and checkers. Brown's daughter-in-law Martha served as cook and housekeeper. His daughter Annie served as lookout. Brown wanted women at the farm, to prevent suspicions of a large all-male group. The raiders went outside at night to drill and get fresh air. Thunderstorms were welcome since they concealed noise from Brown's neighbors. Brown did not plan to have a sudden raid and escape to the mountains. Rather, he intended to use those rifles and pikes he captured at the arsenal, in addition to those he brought along, to arm rebellious slaves with the aim of striking terror in the slaveholders in Virginia. He believed that on the first night of action, 200 to 500 black slaves would join his line. He ridiculed the militia and regular army that might oppose him. He planned to send agents to nearby plantations, rallying the slaves. He planned to hold Harper's Ferry for a short time, expecting that as many volunteers, white and black, would join him as would form against him. He would move rapidly southward, sending out armed bands along the way. They would free more slaves, obtain food, horses and hostages, and destroy slaveholders' morale. Brown planned to follow the Appalachian Mountains south into Tennessee and even Alabama, the heart of the South, making forays into the plains on either side. Advance knowledge of raid Brown paid Hugh Forbes $600 to be his drillmaster. Forbes was an English mercenary who served Giuseppe Garibaldi in Italy. Forbes's manual for the patriotic volunteer was found in Brown's papers after the raid. Brown and Forbes argued over strategy and money. Forbes wanted more money so that his family in Europe could join him. Forbes sent threatening letters to Brown's backers in an attempt to get money. Failing in this effort, Forbes traveled to Washington, D.C., and met with U.S. Senators William H. Seward and Henry Wilson. He denounced Brown to Seward as a vicious man who needed to be restrained, but did not disclose any plans for the raid. Forbes partially exposed the plan to Senator Wilson and others. 
Wilson wrote to Samuel Gridley Howe, a Brown backer, advising him to get Brown's backers to retrieve the weapons intended for use in Kansas. Brown's backers told him that the weapons should not be used, for other purposes, as rumor says they may be. In response to warnings, Brown had to return to Kansas to shore up support and discredit Forbes. Some historians believe that this trip cost Brown valuable time and momentum. Estimates are that at least 80 people knew about Brown's planned raid in advance. Many others had reasons to believe that Brown was contemplating a move against the South. One of those who knew was David J. Gue of Springdale, Iowa. Gue was a Quaker who believed that Brown and his men would be killed. Gue, his brother, and another man decided to warn the government to protect Brown from the consequences of his own rashness. Gue sent an anonymous letter dated August 20, 1859 to Secretary of War John B. Floyd. The letter said that Old John Brown, late of Kansas, was planning to organize a slave uprising in the South. It said that Brown had a secret agent in an armory in Maryland. The letter said that Brown was stockpiling weapons at a secret location in Maryland. Gue warned that Brown planned to leave Maryland and enter Virginia at Harper's Ferry. Gue acknowledged that he was afraid to disclose his identity but asked Floyd not to ignore his warning. On that account, he was hoping that Floyd would send soldiers to Harper's Ferry. He hoped that the extra security would motivate Brown to call off his plans. Even though President Buchanan offered a $250 reward for Brown, Floyd did not connect the John Brown of Gue's letter to the John Brown of Potawatomi, Kansas fame. He knew that Maryland did not have an armory. Harper's Ferry is just across the river from Maryland. Floyd figured that the letter writer was a crank and forgot about it. He later said that a scheme of such wickedness and outrage could not be entertained by any citizen of the United States. The raid Topic October 16 On Sunday night, October 16, 1859, Brown left four of his men behind as a rear guard, his son, Owen Brown, Barclay Coppock, and Frank Miriam, he led the rest into the town of Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Brown detached a party under John Cook Jr. to capture Colonel Lewis Washington, great-grandnephew of George Washington, at his nearby Beale Air estate, some of his slaves, and two relics of George Washington, a sword allegedly presented to Washington by Frederick the Great and two pistols given by Marquis de Lafayette, which Brown considered talismans. The party carried out its mission and returned via the Allstadt House, where they took more hostages. Brown's main party captured several watchmen and townspeople in Harper's Ferry. Brown's men needed to capture the weapons and escape before word could be sent to Washington. The raid was going well for Brown's men. They cut the telegraph wire and seized a Baltimore and Ohio train passing through. A free black man was the first casualty of the raid. Hayward Shepard, an African-American baggage handler on the train, confronted the raiders, they shot and killed him. For some reason, Brown let the train continue, and the conductor alerted the authorities down the line. Brown had been sure that he would win the support of local slaves in joining the rebellion, but a massive uprising did not occur, because word had not been spread about the uprising, so the slaves nearby did not know about it. Although the white townspeople soon began to fight back against the raiders, Brown's men succeeded in capturing the armory that evening. Topic October 17 Army workers discovered Brown's men early on the morning of October 17. Local militia, farmers and shopkeepers surrounded the armory. When a company of militia captured the bridge across the Potomac River, any route of escape for the raiders was cut off. During the day, four townspeople were killed, including the mayor. Realizing his escape was cut, Brown took nine of his captives and moved into the smaller engine house, which would come to be known as John Brown's Fort. The raiders blocked entry of the windows and doors and traded sporadic gunfire with surrounding forces. At one point Brown sent out his son, Watson, and Aaron Dwight Stevens with a white flag, but Watson was mortally wounded and Stevens was shot and captured. The raid was rapidly failing. One of Brown's men, William H. Lehman, panicked and made an attempt to flee by swimming across the Potomac River, but he was shot and fatally injured while doing so. During the intermittent shooting, Brown's other son, Oliver, was also hit. He died after a brief period. At around 3 p.m. a militia company led by Captain E.G. Albertus arrived by train from Martinsburg, Virginia. Most of the militia members were Baltimore and Ohio Railroad employees. The militia forced the raiders inside the engine house. They broke into the guardroom and freed over two dozen prisoners. 
Eight militiamen were wounded. Albertus said that he could have ended the raid with help from other citizens. By 3:30 that afternoon, President James Buchanan ordered a company of U.S. Marines, the only government troops in the immediate area, to march on Harper's Ferry under the command of Brevet Colonel Robert E. Lee, Lieutenant Colonel of the 2nd U.S. Cavalry Regiment. Lee had been on leave from his regiment, stationed in Texas, when he was hastily called to lead the detachment and had to command it while wearing his civilian clothes. October 18 Lee first offered the role of attacking the engine house to the local militia units on the spot. Both militia commanders declined, and Lee turned to the Marines. On the morning of October 18, Colonel Lee sent Lieutenant J. E. B. Stewart, serving as a volunteer aide-de-camp, under a white flag of truce to negotiate a surrender of John Brown and his followers. Colonel Lee informed Lieutenant Israel Green that if Brown did not surrender, he was to direct the Marines in attacking the engine house. Stewart walked towards the front of the engine house where he told Brown that his men would be spared if they surrendered. Brown refused and as Stewart walked away, he signaled a thumbs down to Lieutenant Green and his men standing nearby. Soon after, Green led a detachment of Marines to attack the engine house. Marines equipped with sledgehammers tried to break through the door, but their efforts were unsuccessful. Green found a wooden ladder, and he and about ten Marines used it as a battering ram to force the front doors open. Green was the first through the door and with the assistance of Lewis Washington, identified and singled out John Brown. Green later recounted what events occurred next. Quicker than thought I brought my saber down with all my strength upon Brown's head. He was moving as the blow fell, and I suppose I did not strike him where I intended, for he received a deep saber cut in the back of the neck. He fell senseless on his side, then rolled over on his back. He had in his hand a short sharps cavalry carbine. I think he had just fired as I reached Colonel Washington, for the Marine who followed me into the aperture made by the ladder received a bullet in the abdomen, from which he died in a few minutes. The shot might have been fired by someone else in the insurgent party, but I think it was from Brown. Instinctively as Brown fell I gave him a saber thrust in the left breast. The sword I carried was a light uniform weapon, and, either not having a point or striking something hard in Brown's accoutrements, did not penetrate. The blade bent double. In three minutes, all of the raiders still alive were taken prisoner and the action was over. October 19 Robert E. Lee made a synopsis of the events that took place at Harper's Ferry. According to Lee's notes, Lee believed John Brown was a madman. The plan raiding the Harper's Ferry arsenal was the attempt of a fanatic or madman. Lee also believed that the blacks in the raid were forced by Brown. The blacks, whom he John Brown forced from their homes in this neighborhood, as far as I could learn, gave him no voluntary assistance. Lee attributed John Brown's temporary success by creating panic and confusion and by magnifying the number of participants involved in the raid. <laughs> Aftermath Colonel Lee and Jeb Stewart searched the surrounding country for fugitives who had participated in the attack. Few of Brown's associates escaped, and among those who did, some were sheltered by abolitionists in the north, including William Still. Brown was taken to the courthouse in nearby Charlestown for trial. He was found guilty of treason against the Commonwealth of Virginia and was hanged on December 2. This execution was witnessed by the actor John Wilkes Booth, who would later assassinate President Abraham Lincoln. On the day of his execution, Brown wrote his last testament, which said, First John Brown am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty, land, will never be purged away, but with blood. I had as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. Four other raiders were executed on December 16 and two more on March 16, 1860. In his last speech, at his trial, he said to the court, had I so interfered in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, or in behalf of any of their friends, either father, mother, brother, sister, wife, or children, or any of that class, and suffered and sacrificed what I have in this interference, it would have been all right, and every man in this court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. 
Southerners had a mixed attitude towards their slaves. Many Southern whites lived in fear of a slave insurrection. Paradoxically, whites claimed that slaves were well treated and content in bondage. After the raid Southerners initially lived in fear of slave uprisings and invasion by armed abolitionists. The South's reaction entered the second phase at around the time of Brown's execution. Southerners were relieved that no slaves had volunteered to help Brown. Southerners felt vindicated in their claims that slaves were content. After Northerners had expressed admiration for Brown's motives, with some treating him as a martyr, Southern opinion evolved into what James M. McPherson called, "...unreasoning fury." The first Northern reaction among anti-slavery advocates to Brown's raid was one of baffled reproach. William Lloyd Garrison called the raid, "...misguided, wild, and apparently insane." But through the trial and his execution, Brown was transformed into a martyr. Henry David Thoreau, in a plea for Captain John Brown, said, I think that for once the Sharps rifles and the revolvers were employed in a righteous cause. The tools were in the hands of one who could use them. And said of Brown, He has a spark of divinity in him. Though, Harper's Ferry was insane, wrote the religious weekly The Independent. The controlling motive of his demonstration was sublime. To the South, Brown was a murderer who wanted to deprive them of their property. The North has sanctioned and applauded theft, murder, and treason," said DeBose Review. Casualties John Brown's Raiders Killed John Henry Caggy shot and killed while crossing a river. First buried in common grave at Harper's Ferry, reburied 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York. Jeremiah G. Anderson, at age 26, was mortally wounded and killed by a Marine's bayonet during the final assault on the engine house. Body claimed by Winchester Medical College as a teaching cadaver, last resting place unknown. William Thompson, first buried in common grave at Harper's Ferry, reburied 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York. Dauphin Thompson, killed in the storming of the engine house. First buried in common grave at Harper's Ferry, reburied 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York. Oliver Brown, at age 21, the youngest of John Brown's three sons to participate in the action, he was mortally wounded on the 17th inside the engine house and died the next day. He was first buried in common grave at Harper's Ferry, and reburied in 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York. Watson Brown, at age 24, was mortally wounded outside the engine house while carrying a white flag to negotiate with the opposing militia, he died two days later. As his body was claimed by Winchester Medical College as a teaching cadaver, Union troops burned the college in an attack during the Civil War. Brown was reburied in 1882 in a grave near his father's in North Elba, New York. Stuart Taylor. Uxbridge, Ontario, Canada first buried in common grave at Harper's Ferry, reburied 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York. William Lehman shot while trying to escape across the Potomac River. First buried in common grave at Harper's Ferry, reburied 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York. Lewis Sheridan Leary, a 24-year-old free black, he was mortally wounded while trying to escape across the Shenandoah River. He was stationed in the rifle factory with Kagi. Alleged to be buried at John Brown gravesite at North Elba, New York. Cenotaph Memorial in Oberlin, Ohio. Dangerfield Newby, at about 35, he was born into slavery, with a white father who was not his master. He was given permission to move to Ohio along with his mother and siblings, but when he tried to gain freedom for his wife and children, their master refused. This inspired Newby to join Brown's raid. He was the first raider killed. His body was mutilated, for example, his ears were cut off by someone in the crowd as souvenirs. First he was buried at Harper's Ferry, reburied in 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York, captured. John Brown, also wounded, tried, convicted and executed by hanging December 2, 1859, in nearby Charlestown. Aaron Dwight Stevens, shot and captured October 18. Hanged March 16, 1860 in Charlestown. 
First buried at Eagleswood Mansion, New Jersey, reburied 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York. Edwin Coppock at age 24, he shot and killed the mayor of Harper's Ferry, Fontaine Beckham, during the raid. He was later executed at Charlestown on December 16, 1859 and was buried in Salem, Ohio. John Anthony Copeland, Jr., a 25-year-old free black, he joined the raiders along with his uncle Louis Leary. He was captured during the raid and executed on December 16, 1859, in Charlestown. The body was claimed by Winchester Medical College as a teaching cadaver. The last resting place is unknown. Cenotaph Memorial in Oberlin, Ohio. Shields Green, at about age 23, Green was an escaped slave from South Carolina, captured in the engine house on October 18, 1859 and hanged December 16, 1859 in Charlestown. The body was claimed by Winchester Medical College as a teaching cadaver. The last resting place is unknown. Cenotaph Memorial in Oberlin, Ohio. John Edwin Cook escaped into Pennsylvania but soon captured. Hanged December 16, 1859 in Charlestown. Body sent to New York. Albert E. Hazlitt escaped into Pennsylvania but soon captured. Hanged March 16, 1860. Buried at Eagleswood Mansion in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, reburied 1899 in a common grave near John Brown at North Elba, New York, four raiders escaped and were captured about six months later. Escaped and never captured Barclay Coppock died during U.S. Civil War Charles Plummer Tidd died during U.S. Civil War Osborne Perry Anderson served as a soldier in Union Army, and wrote a memoir about the raid. Died 1870 Owen Brown served as an officer in Union Army. Died January 8, 1889. Pasadena, California, Brown's Mountain. Francis Jackson Miriam served in the Army as a captain in the 3rd South Carolina Colored Infantry. Topic Others Civilians Hayward Shepard, free African American B&O baggage master, killed. Buried in African American Cemetery on RT, 11 in Winchester, VA, grave is unmarked Thomas Borley, townsperson, killed, George W. Turner, townsperson, killed, Fontaine Beckham, town mayor, killed, a slave belonging to Call. Washington was killed. A slave belonging to hostage John Alsted was killed, some claim the two slaves voluntarily joined Brown's raiders, others say Brown forced them to fight. Regardless, one was killed trying to escape across the Potomac River, the other was wounded and later died in the Charlestown Jail, nine other civilians were wounded. Marines Private Luke Quinn killed during the storming of the engine house, buried in Harper's Ferry Catholic Cemetery on Route 340. Private Matthew Ruppert shot in the face during the storming of the engine house, survived. Topic. Liberated slaves. Mayor Beckham's will book called for the liberation of Isaac Gilbert, his wife, and three children upon his death. When Edwin Coppock killed Beckham the five slaves were free. Legacy Heritage area In 1944, Harper's Ferry and some surrounding areas were designated as a national monument. Congress later designated it as the Harper's Ferry National Historical Park in 1963. It is managed by the National Park Service. The park includes the historic town of Harper's Ferry, notable as a center of 19th century industry and as the scene of the uprising. Topic: In popular culture. Santé Fe Trail 1940, an American Western film set before the Civil War that mostly depicts John Brown's campaign during Bleeding Kansas and ends with the raid on the Harper's Ferry, starring Ronald Reagan, Errol Flynn, and Raymond Massey. John Brown's trial and execution are briefly covered in the TV miniseries The Blue and the Gray 1982. Harry Paget Flashman, the title character of George MacDonald Fraser's Flashman novels, takes a reluctant part in the raid in the tenth novel, Flashman and the Angel of the Lord. See also 
List of incidents of civil unrest in the United States Origins of the American Civil War Notes Citations Topic further reading A.V., Elijah The Capture and Execution of John Brown. Chicago, Brethren Publishing House. Retrieved November 6, 2018. Eyewitness. Earl, Jonathan. John Brown's Raid on Harper's Ferry, A Brief History with Documents 2008 excerpt and text search field, Ron. Avenging Angel, John Brown's Raid on Harper's Ferry 1859 2012. Osprey Raid Series No. 36. Osprey Publishing. ISBN 9781849087575 Fraser, George MacDonald. Flashman and the Angel of the Lord 1994 Lee, Robert E. Call. Robert E. Lee's Report Concerning the Attack at Harper's Ferry, October 19, 1859 Online Horwitz, Tony. Midnight Rising, John Brown and the Raid that Sparked the Civil War 2011 Henry Holt and Company Mason, J.M. Senate Select Committee Report on the Harper's Ferry Invasion, June 15, 1860 Online Nolte, Bernard C. The United States Marines at Harper's Ferry and in the Civil War 1959 History and Museums Division, United States Marine Corps, Online National Park Service History Series. John Brown's Raid, Virginia Beach, Virginia, The Dunning Company Publishers 2009 Nevins, Allen. The Emergence of Lincoln, Prelude to Civil War, 1859-1861 Volume 4 of The Ordeal of the Union, especially ch 3 pp 70-97 Oates, Stephen B. To Purge This Land with Blood, A Biography of John Brown 1984. Amherst, M. A., The University of Massachusetts Press. Potter, David M. The Impending Crisis, 1848-1861 pp 356-84, Pulitzer Prize winning history Reynolds, David S. John Brown, Abolitionist, The Man Who Killed Slavery, Sparked the Civil War, and Ceded Civil Rights 2006, Villard, Oswald Garrison. John Brown, 1800-1859, a biography 50 years after 1910-738 pages, full text online Thomas, Emery M. Robert E. Lee, a biography 1995. New York, W. W. Norton and Company. <laughs> <laughs> External links Michael E. Ruane, October 14, 2009. 150 years later, John Brown's failed slave revolt marches on. The Washington Post. John Brown 150 years after Harper's Ferry by Terry Bisson, Monthly Review, October 2009.